Yeah, okay. So um, this is going to be an introduction to machine learning. It's the second year I've given it. I've tweaked it a little, but it's actually largely similar to last year. So um, I am a, oh, wrong computer, I'm using this one. I am a PhD fellow here. Um, I'm actually a cardiology reg, but I'm doing a welcome to a sponsored PhD in machine learning and cardiovascular imaging. So a bit of MRI, a bit of echo, um, but most of the time I spend my time programming rather than touching patients. Um, and so today we're going to talk about what machine learning is, general types of machine learning, and then a couple of worked examples of it in use so you can sort of see its strengths and its weaknesses. Um, I want this to sort of give you an idea so when you read a paper in a cardiology journal about machine learning, you can understand what they're talking, even if you couldn't, talking about, even if you couldn't do it yourself. So the thing is, right, machine learning has only really become a huge deal that you guys have heard of probably in the last four years or so. And the reason why it's become a big deal now isn't because it's only just been invented, but because actually we have the computing power to be able to do this. So on the right hand side of the screen, we have a mobile phone playing Quake 2. When I was little, Quake 2 required an incredibly powerful computer to play. Not only could a phone play it now, but a phone can play both co two copies of Quake 2 at the same time, one for your left eye and one for your right eye, to give you a 3D perspective. And the idea that we'd have this much computing power back then was just amazing. So we have computers that can do very, very um, complex amount of calculations and maths. But the problem is, for a lot of things, this doesn't help us. So there's two questions here. Which one of these is harder for you? The left one, OK. So, but then again, um, if you were going to ask a computer to solve it, the left one is really easy, right? You just try and divide 261 by every number between 2 and itself, or half itself. And if there's no remainder, then you know it's not a prime number anymore. That's super easy. OK. Now, try and imagine you're trying to explain a computer whether that is a cat or not. OK. So is that a cat? No. So explain to me why it's not a cat. How do you know it's not a cat? It's a dog. Okay. So why does it, why do you think it's a dog and not a cat? Cat dog. Yeah. Okay. But did all dogs look the same? Okay. So, but you could probably tell all dogs apart from all cats. So, what is dog like about this dog? Okay. So cats tendly have more pointed upper ears. Not always. Eyes. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. Nose is actually pretty triangular, which is a cat-like thing. Unfortunately, you guys are all far too intelligent, because last year someone said whiskers, which I was really hope hopeful that one of you would say, because in fact this dog has whiskers. But the thing is, imagine trying to program a computer to tell you whether this is a dog or a cat. That is incredibly difficult to do, right? Especially when a dog could be a chihuahua or a Great Dane. So the thing is, how did you learn what are dogs and cats? You learned it because your parents sat down with you with lots of picture books from birth and just showed you example after example after example of dogs and cats. And you just learned by pattern. You learned what was a dog and what was a cat. No one actually sat down with you and explained to you the difference between dogs and cats. You learned by example. And that's sort of how machine learning works. So, oh, wrong computer again. So, it's with stopping programming computers to do a task. And we're programming computers so they can learn how to do the tasks themselves. And that's the idea of today's talk. And we'll talk about how we can do that. So these are some examples. So machine learning in everyday life is used for handwriting recognition. Some handwriting is very good and very neat. Some handwriting is awful. Okay? And most people's handwriting is different. And machine learning has a, and our brains are able to cope with that quite well, actually. Now, the second letter. I think even a normal human would struggle with. But it probably says Mary something, and then maybe the Department of Ministerial Health? I don't know, actually, I've never really looked at it before. But it's quite difficult to explain why you know that's what it says, but your brain is able to identify the patterns of the letters and string it together, which is quite impressive. The next thing is AlphaGo, which as I'm sure you know, now a computer through machine learning has been better than the Grandmaster of Go. Siri uses machine learning to interpret your voice, and also Netflix. So Netflix is, uh, well, what was their flagship show, House of Cards. Does anyone know the story behind this, how this came to be? 
So what they did was they looked at what people were watching on their service. And there was an original UK drama called House of Cards, which I think was in the 1970s, which was a UK political drama, just like the modern one. And um, they realized that a lot of people really, really liked this. And once they watched one episode, they watched them all. Um, but also, there was a huge overlap in people in this group and people that love Kevin Spacey. So they thought, well, why don't we remake it again with Kevin Spacey? They might be synergistic. And lo and behold, probably one of the most successful programs until recent events in Netflix history was invented through machine learning. So moving on to machine learning now, there's broadly two types of machine learning. Okay, well, you, If you're going to read a paper, does anyone know what they are? You've got the slides, so I don't know why I'm asking, but pretend you haven't read them. So it's supervised, okay, supervised learning, and you're going to see more of this, okay? Um, what you do with supervised learning is you feed it data, but you feed it data where you know what it is, okay? So you feed it a load of dog pictures, and you say, these are dogs. And you feed it a load of cat pictures, and you say, these are cats. Um, so you feed it the labels as well as the data, and it learns how to rate them. So it learns what's a dog-like thing and what's a cat-like thing. Unsupervised learning is different, okay? With that, you feed it the data, and you tell it how many groups, for example, you want it to break it down into. So you might have a folder of a million dogs and a million cats, and you don't know which ones are dogs and cats, but you want it to split it into two. Now, obviously this is easier in principle, because you don't have to go through a million pictures of dogs and cats, but the disadvantage is the difference it will probably find is not the one you want it to find. So for example, it might actually think the easiest way to split them up is to black and white animals. Okay? And this is the disadvantage of unsupervised learning. And in medicine, we normally do have the answer. We have whether someone is dead, or whether someone's alive, or whether they had cancer or not, or whether the ECG was actually an infarct, or whether the ECG was VT, or supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. We've got the answer. We're just trying to train a computer to figure out the answer. So we normally, in medical research, do supervised learning. And to be honest, if you read pretty much any paper on machine learning in medicine, it will be supervised learning. But there is this other form called unsupervised learning, which can sometimes have its advantages. So, let's go to a scenario. So you've decided that you want to take up a summer job at Imperial, and you volunteer at the University Botanic Gardens. I assume Imperial has botanic gardens, I don't know. But if they don't, just imagine they do. And uh, you lie on the application, you tell them you know all about flowers. But actually, you don't know a thing. Does anyone know what flower this is on the right-hand side? Don't look at the slides. I don't know why I keep asking you questions or answers that are on the slides. So they're irises, okay? So I didn't know that either, but irises are very famous in medical statistics. So the, lead, the lead gardener comes up to you and says, so I've heard you apply for this job and you know a lot about flowers. Um, so I want you to bring me, uh, we have three types of, he says, we have three types of irises in this garden. I want you to bring me one of each. Iris, Satosa, Iris, VZ collar, and Iris, whatever the other one was called, I can't remember. One of each. So you think, oh, crumbs. Okay. Um, so you get out your phone, as any normal person would do, and you Google their three names, and you look up examples. And you see that, okay, on these examples, the colors are slightly different, but actually, within each class, it could be any color. So the color doesn't tell you anything. And you look at these, and they're, like, they're very, very simple. And there may be some subtle differences. Like the one on the right, it's got these big petally things, but it doesn't seem to have the big kind of, doesn't seem to have these things. But these two, I mean, they're so similar. Maybe this is a bit wider, don't know. Anyway, you decide that what you're gonna do it is you're gonna measure these plants and you're gonna use unsupervised machine learning to split all the plants you've measured into three groups. Cause you know there's three different categories. You just don't know which one's which, okay? So it's an unsupervised learning problem. So does anyone know who this is on the left? So this is Fisher. You know, like Fisher's exact test, all that stats and stuff. But he came up with a very, very famous data set called the Iris data set. Now, Fisher knew a lot about flowers, unlike us, and he actually knew all about irises. And he went around his garden, and he measured, I can't remember how many, maybe 50 of each kind of iris, and took four measurements. He measured the width and length of these sepals and the width and length of these petals, okay? And this is a publicly available data set and it's used in lots of textbooks and things like that. But you can put them into an Excel spreadsheet 
or an R table like we have on the right hand side here, and you've got four variables, okay, and each row is what are those four measurements. And as I said, what we're going to do is we're going to feed it into some kind of unsupervised machine learning system, and we're going to ask it to split them as best it can into three different groups, okay? So we're going to talk about how this might work. So one way of doing unsupervised learning is an algorithm called k-means. Now, this is a very busy slide, which I apologize for. We'll break it down. It actually makes a lot of sense. So what you do here is you plot, you take two of your variables in this example. I know we have four variables. We've got petal, width, and length, and sepal width and length. But imagine you just had two for this example. You plot them as the x and y coordinates of this graph. So this point is something with a, a relatively small length and width of both, and this one is quite big of both, okay? And you decide how many groups you're going to have. So we said we're going to split into three groups, and you just randomly throw down three of these markers, which we call means, okay? So we throw a red one down, a green one down, a blue one down. Where they go, it doesn't really matter. We just put them down. And then what we do is we draw a line on our plot, which, where each dot owns the spot, well, each spot, in fact, is owned by the dot that is nearest to it, okay? So for this plant that we've measured, the nearest dot we've only thrown down is red, okay, so it's red. As for this one, it's green. For these ones, it's blue. Okay, that's very simple. And then what we do is we move that dot we randomly threw down so it's in the center of all the flowers it owns. So as we said, this red one, the only one it has is this square plant that we've measured. So it moves on top of that. The green one, most of its domain is a little bit lower down. There's only two above it, there's four below it, so it moves downwards. And the blue one moves a little bit downwards as well. No, upwards, in fact. Okay? And so now it looks like this. So now the red one owns three, because there's one underneath there, owns three plants. The green one owns four plants, and the blue one owns five plants. And we just repeat this cycle, okay, until the dots stop moving around. Okay, it sounds very simple. And this is what it would look like in action. So this is on a data set which is split into three groups, and it starts off with a blue group, it'll restart. It starts off with a blue group, very small, and slowly these sort of markers swing around until they're in the center of groups. And you can see this one has split a group up here into red, and this big group down here into green, and this group up here into blue. Okay? So there's no neural networks or anything like that, which we're going to go into in a bit, but this is all unsupervised learning, and you've just taken a data set. Now, I know that we said we had four variables, not just two. So our data won't look quite like this. Our data would, well, in fact, our data won't even look like this because this is with three variables. But it shows how it would work in a three-variable space. So if you wanted, for example, this could be petal length, petal width, and sepal length or something. This is split up into three groups. Okay? So that's k-means. I don't know what this slide is meant to show. Oh, okay. So what we do is now... We go to our lead gardener, we take in the three examples of the flowers, okay, we put one right from the centre of one group, one right from the centre of the other, one right from the centre of the third, and we show it to the gardener and we say, how's this? And he goes, oh, wow, I'm very impressed. You could tell them apart. So you feel very smug, but then you feel quite guilty and you um, tell him the truth. You don't know anything about flowers, you just know how to do machine learning. And he's actually quite pleased, because he knew you didn't know anything about flowers anyway, he was just testing you. So what you do is you then show them your graph. And um, this is if you just plotted with petal width and petal length what you thought this scenario, what you thought examples were. Okay, so you thought these ones down here were one group, but you said that this is split into two groups that's around this mark. And then what you do is you get in to check your data and go through all the plants, and then you plot that as another graph. And you'll see it's almost exactly the same. So you actually correctly identified that this was a group on its own. And you correctly identified that there was a break here. A couple of these you've got wrong. So for example, these ones are actually in the, the lower ground group and you've got them in the upper one here. But you've done a pretty good job here. So for this example, unsupervised learning worked quite well. But I will promise you that if you've done supervised learning, if you'd have been able to tell it what each example was before you started, you'd have done even better. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about supervised learning. Okay, and this is what you're going to be reading about in nearly all papers, okay? Oh, go ahead. In the last slide, was it relevant? Yeah, sorry. That should, they should, the colours, you're right, it's misleading. 
the, the colours are irrelevant. I need to change that. No, the, the colours being different colours doesn't matter. But no, good question. I should have said that. So supervised learning. So this is what you're going to read out in most cases. And this is really good when you already have the answers. So by definition, something that humans can do, because you've been able to assign a class, that you want a computer to either do quicker or sometimes even better than a human can. Okay? So this is going to be our scenario. So you got fired from the botanical gardens, um, and instead you got a job at the university library. Okay? And uh, you got a job sorting books into French and German. Now, you're not fluent in French and German, um, but that doesn't matter for this. Um, so you're going to pick up a book from the floor, because they basically, a benefactor, an old mad benefactor, has given you a lorry full of French and German books. Don't know why, he's old and mad. And your job is to sort them into French and German, okay? So, uh, does anyone here speak French or German fluently? Three of you. Okay, so you guys aren't allowed to talk now, or you're not allowed to answer any questions. So, oh, I'm going to again. So, for the ones of you that aren't fluent in French or German, we're going to go through some words, and you're going to tell me whether it's a French word or a German word. Okay? So, first, is this French or German? German. Okay, good. How did you know? Looks German. Very good. I'm going to need you to be more specific. It's quite difficult to, come to program a computer to say whether something is Germanic sounding or not, because you have to kind of tell it what's Germanic sounding. Yeah, yeah. E there are, there are, aren't there? But EN is normally German, you're right. So I think that's probably a reasonable rule. And it doesn't have any. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that may be. Unfortunately, all the words I'm going to show you have no French accents in for that very reason, but that is useful. So is this word French or German? German. Ragingly German, right? So what's very Germanic about this? The double S is very German, right? What about this word? Yeah, what's inside it? Yeah, there we go. So that rule doesn't work so well, does it? And I randomly picked these words. This worked out so perfectly. Um, what about this? Yeah, I think that's quite a hard one myself. Yeah, I think if you took the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the ENT at the end is, is very French, you're right. So what's interesting about this is even though you guys don't know French or German, you somehow have an ability to recognise Frenchness and Germanness. That you have been exposed to, not even by, okay, you've probably all done French GCSE, I guess. But even if you hadn't, I reckon you'd be able to have a good stab at this. Because you've kind of picked up the flavour of words, and you've come up with your own rule system, even though you don't, you've never really formally been taught any of them. So it's quite interesting. We've got quite a few words here, some of which are easier than others. I think this one here is actually quite difficult. Yeah, it is French. But I think if, I, think if I gave you Wenger, you'd say German. And it's got a double S in. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. We'll ignore that. So, anyway, what you're going to do now is we're going to use supervised learning, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to get a French dictionary at a off a shelf and a German dictionary off a shelf, and you're going to train a computer to tell you, when you type in new words, whether it's French or German. Okay? So a neural network is just a computer program on your computer, and it looks like this. Okay? So... Each of these lines between these spots is a neuron, and that neuron, in fact, it's a synapse, sorry. Each of these blobs is a neuron, okay? And each of these lines between is a synapse. But what we start off doing is if we have a word, um, we feed in the word here. So we feed the first letter in that neuron, second letter in that neuron, third letter in that neuron, and so on, all the way down to a maximum of 15 letters. Um, and then what we do is each neuron in the first layer is connected randomly via synapses. So actually, each neuron is connected to every neuron below it. But whether that's a, an inhibitory or a stimulatory connection, whether it's strong or weak, when you first let the neural network is completely random. Okay? 
and uh, we've got a load of neurons here, and they all connect to all the neurons below. And at the end, they all feed into one neuron, which at the end, after you type in a word, might be firing very hard, might be firing not at all, or it might be somewhere in between. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're just going to arbitrarily say, if the neuron at the end is firing really, really, really quickly, we're going to call it a French word. If it's firing really, 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 really slowly, we're going to call it a German word. And if it's somewhere in between, we'll say it's 50-50, we don't know. It could be the other way around, it doesn't really matter. And uh, we've got two sets of these hidden layers between. So those are the neurons between the input and the output that do the processing of the data. They're almost the bits that are making the decisions. Okay? So, what we have here is 156,000 synapses on this diagram, okay? Each line is a synapse. So that's 156,000 things that we can tweak so this neuron does what, this neural network does what we want it to do, okay? And the way we do that is by training. So this is an example of me training a neural network, which I'm about to show you. So what I've done is I've just taken random words out of the French and German dictionary, okay? And I'm feeding it into the network on the left. So you can see when the word on the right pops up, it also pops up on the left-hand column. Okay, and that causes some of the neurons to activate, and when they activate, they go bright red. If they're pink, they're a little bit active. If they're white, they're not active at all. And you can see that this neuron on the right is um, alternating between green and blue, which either means French or German. I can't remember which way around it is. That doesn't matter. I don't know why I've stopped. Um, and w the way that the training of the neural network works Every time we show it, when we first make it, it's got a 50% chance of being right or wrong, right? Because there's only two options. But we might show it the word bonjour. If it says that is German, it's got that wrong. So what then we do is we use maths to say, for each synapse, how do we tweak it so it would have said more French? So you take the first synapse and you say, if I make that stronger, is bonjour more French or less French? The answer is more French, you make that synapse stronger. The answer is less French, you make that synapse weaker. And you do that for all of them. And you just keep feeding it answers again and again and again and tweaking them. And you hope in the end, it will start giving you the right answer. Go ahead. What's the nature of the synapse? What's the nature of the synapse? So actually, the synapse, so this, these structures don't really exist. They're just a good way of writing it down. What you're actually doing is you have uh, a data structure, so you have this is stored in a byte of memory, this is stored in a byte of memory, this is stored in a byte of memory. So each letter is, a, is a, uh, a piece of data which is associated with a value. So a U may have a certain value, a T may have a certain value. Those things are fairly arbitrary. And then for each one of these, each synapse, you've just got a line in your memory which is just a positive number or a negative number. And it multiplies the last number by that. So if that number's a negative number, that makes the signal weaker. So you can think of that as an inhibitory neuron. And if that number is positive, it makes it stronger. So for example, the activity of this neuron, which as we can see is very active, is there'll be a, there'll be a synapse between this neuron and all of the neurons here. So there's a synapse from, from this one to it, 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 this one to it. And they will all, they are just numbers. Each one of those is a number. And that number is what, if there was a letter in there, say Z, what Z is multiplied by. And if that's very, if that number ends up very big, we say this neuron is very active. And if that number ends up very small, we say it's off, we say it's white. Actually, although we like drawing these things out as neural networks, because it makes sense, because that's how our brain works, um, these are actually just multiplica multiplication, normally, operations in a computer. All right, so, shall we see if it works? So, this is our neural network that we have trained. I'm on my laptop now. And what we're going to do get the words we had before. Mm. Let's say close that. Yeah. Word 
that list. And we're going to get on your honour. So, I have been clever because what I have done is I have removed these words from the dictionary for training the neural network, okay? Because you could say, oh, James, you've got no proof that this is actually learning what's French and German. It may have just remembered that volen den den is a German word. It may not have learned anything. It may not have learned to generalise like you guys have done. Because you guys are very good because you guys don't know the words, and yet you're able to say whether it's French or German. That's a much more useful skill, because that means if there's a typo, or a new word comes out, or there's a word not in the dictionary, or the slang, that you guys would get it right. But if all your neural network's doing is, rec is remembering each word one by one, it won't be able to cope with new words it's not seen before. So what I've done is I've removed these words from the, from the dictionary that I trained the neural network on, so it's never seen these before, and it'll just have to make an educated guess. So, let's try it. So, V... Oh. So, V... It thinks, the it thinks the letter V is French. Maybe it is. Maybe more French words than you with V. Vol... Okay, vol is German, but vole is French. Volen den den is 100% German. You can't get much more German than that. Okay, let's try another one. B, so B, B is French, B, I is German, B, N is German, B, N, flu, so we're pretty German now. Interestingly, that is more French, it, that makes it more French, but B, N, flusters is 98% German. Good. Let's pick our double S word that was French. So, R, A, L, L, E, S. So it's very French. So you guys are right. So it is actually able to sort of, it's obviously not just doing very common things. Because what was interesting about that is that is quite French, 62.8% French. But if you add the double S, which we think is a, yeah, it's able to become slightly more French even when you add in the double S, which you think would be a German kind of flavor, but obviously not. However, when you add the I, O, and S, which you said was a very French thing, it becomes very, very French. So this is quite interesting. So you've been able to train your network, and that will probably take about 10 minutes to do on your laptop to train something like that. So it works. Um, now, the thing is, you could say, so what? OK? You could just give the members of staff, instead of getting to use this neural network on their iPhone where they type in the title, it tells you whether it's French or, or German, you could just give them a dictionary, right? So tell me what the advantages of this might be over giving them a dictionary. They, um, what do you mean, sorry? Yeah. It might, it might not know that that's French until first looks at the first word and goes, oh, this is French, now I'm translating it from French. That's true, but that doesn't tell us what the advantage of using a neural network is, because what it could do is you could take the first word and it could just look through the French dictionary on the computer, look through the German dictionary, look through the Spanish, look through the Russian, and as soon as it finds it's in one of them, it could go with that one, right? Ah, exactly. So if you slightly misspelt it, the dictionary won't work anymore, but there's probably enough pattern in the word that there is. The other advantage is file size. So this neural network, if you save it with its 150,000 synapses, is about 72 kilobytes on your computer. That's very small. That's smaller than one photo taken, well, much smaller than one photo taken on your iPhone. The German dictionary that I trained it off was 4 meg. Okay, and the French one was another, I think it was six megs. So it's 10 megabytes to 72 kilobytes. So you're less than 1% of the size. Now, obviously, both of these things are small, but just imagine they were pictures you were training off and not words. So imagine if you're going back to your cat and dog example, the analogy would be having a neural network, which may be a couple of megabytes in size, or having a picture of every single dog or cat on the planet and searching through those. It's just impractical. It's semi-practical when we're dealing with words, but most of the time we're dealing with neural networks. We're trying to classify things that aren't just a couple of letters, but a very complex image and complex data sets. So being able to make a decision with a neural network is often a lot quicker and a lot smaller file size. So we're going to talk about a clinical problem that um, 
that I and my BSc student last year have solved with neural networks. So, this is Mr. Smith, and he attends hospital, A&E, with ICD shocks. So you guys know what an ICD is? So it's an implantable defibrillator, it's like a pacemaker, and it electrocutes you when? When does it electrocute you? Good. So what are those bad rhythms normally? BT and BF. Excellent. So uh, Mr. Smith gets electrocuted whilst this is on the monitor. So what's going on? Is that VT or VF? That's normal sinus rhythm. It's not entirely normal. It's someone who's had a previous heart attack. I know you guys don't know about ECGs, but he's got Q waves in the inferior leaves with T wave inversion, and he's also got a slightly weird QRS. So it looks like someone who's probably had a heart attack previously, but this is normal sinus rhythm. So he shouldn't have been electrocuted. Okay? So, I've just ruined the next slide, but you've got them anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So, um, what are you going to do? He keeps getting electrocuted. What are you going to do? Yeah, so you could adjust the sensitivity. The thing is, how do you think, when you say adjust the sensitivity, that's not a silly thing to say, but what do you think is probably going on? I know you guys don't know how ICDs work exactly, but what do you think is probably going on? Wrongly placed. So if it's wrongly placed, um, so it wasn't in the heart, you'd actually expect nothing on the ECG, right? What do we call that rhythm when there's nothing? Asystole. Do defib shock for asystole? No, they don't. They only shock for fast rhythms, BT and VF. So this is actually probably some kind of interference, or what it might be is that the insulation on the lead has come off. And they're rubbing on each other and they're making a crack. You don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's purely academic. But what, the only way you're going to stop whatever this problem is, is by turning it off. Okay? If you look, his ECG isn't paced. There's no pacing spike. So he, if you turn the device off, you're going to be fine. But if you don't turn it off, he'll keep getting electrocuted again and again and again. And that's not good. So you need to turn it off. So what you normally do is you say, hi, Mr. Smith. Um, who makes your... DFib, who makes your pacemaker. And the reason that's important is if you want to turn it off, um, it's, you need different equipment, whether it's a Medtronic, whether it's a Sorin, whether it's a St. Jude, whether it's a Biotronic, whether it's a Boston Scientific, they all need different equipment. And you've got to drag those on wheels from the pacing department to A&E, which, for example, in Mary's is over the road. Okay, so it's not ideal. You can't take all of them to the bedside. So you need a way, if he hasn't brought his ID card, which he won't have done, um, you need a way of being able to figure out which one it is. So I've already spoiled it for you. One of the ways of doing this is by looking at the x-ray. Okay? So this is the algorithm on the right. It's incredibly difficult to use. And this is his x-ray on the left. Now, I don't know if on your slides, if you guys can figure out what you think it is. Is it, are your slides high resolution enough? It's tough. Um, and in fact, it's a trick question because this device is so new, it's not on the flowchart. It's slightly like this Medtronic one. If you look, it's actually very similar, but the dark bit is light and the light bit is dark. I don't know why they swapped it, but it is actually a Medtronic. But unfortunately, this flowchart, not only is it quite hard to use, it's out of date. You can't use this anymore. So we thought, well, why don't we just get a load of pictures of people's ICDs and pacemakers and things like that and train a neural network to do it? So would that be supervised learning or unsupervised learning? And why is that? Exactly. We're going to show a load of Medtronic devices and say, these are Medtronic. Learn what a Medtronic is like. These are St. Jude. Learn what these are like. Okay? So uh, this is what we did. And I just sat there initially with my iPhone on 3,000 pictures of pacemakers and just took picture after picture after picture after picture and stored them in a spreadsheet. And I said, number one, number 100, for example, here is a Medtronic advisor. 
number 119 is a St. Jude Allure Quadra. And I just went through, went through every patient, had a pacemaker, put it in Hampson Hospital, I saved all the images. Okay? How long did that take? How long did that take? Mm, um, well, actually, I did it twice because I started off doing it with the iPhone because I thought this is good because um, that's probably how people use it in real life, right? They'll go up to the A&E x-ray and they'll take it on the iPhone. The problem is everyone's phone is different. Some are fuzzier than others, some are blurrier than others. Um, and in the end, what I decided was it'd be better to crop it so the images are beautifully crisp because it'll work much better then, even though it may not work quite as well on iPhones. I ended up doing it, I probably gathered about a thousand, which probably took a couple of days. Uh, and then I binned all those, and then I gathered another 4,000, which probably took, if you made me do it 9 to 5, probably a week, I guess. But not that long. Consider how long people sit there petting in labs, probably pet for more than a week. So not too bad. Pretty soul-destroying, um, but, but not too time-consuming um, when it comes to getting a paper. So the thing is, though, we're not just training on words and letters now. Right? So word and letters are quite easy, okay? You're just, if you've got an eight-letter word, you're only feeding in eight variables. If you want to feed in an image that is 100 by 100 pixels, and your neural network works by looking at each pixel, then you now need 10,000 input neurons, okay? Um, so we took a much bigger network, and not only is it bigger, is it not only is it wider at the start, so not only is this, instead of being 15, many, many, many more, it's um, also much longer. So each one of these yellow dots is a layer in the network. So there's many, many, many layers, and that adds up to being around 100,000 synapses. Okay? Now, because of that, when I said you could train this on this computer, the last one on this computer in about 10 minutes, obviously this takes a lot longer. But it's not 10,000 minutes, because you can be a lot cleverer with the maths, and although you couldn't run it on this computer very quickly, um, computers with graphics cards in them, which are typically used for computer games and things like that, can actually be used incredibly effectively for this. And the reason is, most processors on computers are good at doing things one after each other. But it's a little bit like cooking. You can only do one thing at once, okay? You whisk the eggs, and then you fold them in, or whatever. You can't do both those things at the same time. And most computers are tuned to be able to do one thing after the other very quickly. But graphics cards are very good at doing a thousand things at once. Each time it does that thing, it'd be slower than if this computer did it, but it's good at doing lots of things at once. And actually working out how each synapse has to be tweaked can be done at the same time. So you could tweak all the synapses in the same time as it takes to tweak one of them on this computer. That's a slight oversimplification, but not much. So actually, you could train this neural network, although it's about a thousand times more complicated, you could probably train it in 45 minutes on a decent computer. Good. So we're going to actually see if it works. So last year, I did it on this x-ray. right? But that isn't high stakes enough, because I know it works, because I did it last year. So what we're going to do, boss, this is going to be embarrassing if it doesn't work, um, is you are going to tell me, as, within reason, it's got to be one the neural network at least has seen before, we're going to Google pacemaker chest x-ray. We're going to look at pictures, and you're going to tell me which one you want me to put through the neural network. So, I think it's probably seen most of these. So, so this isn't on packs at Imperial. This is just Google Images. If you want, yeah, well, you think I'm that corrupt. Unfortunately, it's, it's auto-scrolling, but we can go down a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. You think I'm that guilty? Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. So this is true. Um, so do you want to pick one of these guys? Far right. This one. But not this one. This one's or this one. Come on, pick one. 
The second one, oh, too easy. Alright, so we're saving this onto the desktop. I, to show you that it's correct, where should I say that? I'm going to tell you what I think it is. I think it's a Boston. The reason I can say that is because I save 5,000 of these. So I am incredibly well trained at classification of pacemakers. Um, oh, yes. So I've got, I've got, I haven't done it myself, but I've got five radiology. I've got five electrophysiologists whose job is to put these in, and they see these under fluoro every day. And they had one sad guy who sat there with the algorithm and using his own knowledge, and was just took there for a week. I only gave him 252. It took him a week, and he was only 92% correct. The neural network is 99.6% correct on the manufacturer. It is about 92%. It's about 94% correct in getting the exact model name. Okay, so I told you I think it's a Boston. We'll see if it agrees. God, this is going to be so bad. Excellent. Good. So it thinks it is. It is 100% confident this picture you chose is a Boston Ultra or Insignia. Do you agree? What do you mean you're not sure? Well, I'll tell you, it definitely is. Um, it's not a Medtronic Vita, and it's not a Soren Rhapsody. So... You think it looks more like the bottom one? Well, I'll tell you it's not. It's a Boston, as I told you it was. So this is the thing. These decisions are... So that's so interesting that you can't... So to me, it's so obviously a Boston, because I've seen it so many times before. But to you guys, it's not. Should we, do you want to pick another? Yeah. All right. Do one that's difficult. Um, I mean, there are some of these that I'm not entirely sure. This one? A blurry picture. <laughs> so, that, so that's a good question. If I put in my face, right, it'll still guess. It'll go Medtronic Advisor. Because it ha I haven't given it, uh, there isn't a pacemaker group. And some people say, well, why don't you do that? But the problem is, if I think it's something that's very blurry, I still want it to make a guess. I don't want it to have the there isn't a pacemaker cop out, because that isn't actually of any use to anyone. If some retard puts in a picture that doesn't have a pacemaker in it, it's not my fault if it says it's a Medtronic advisor, right? So I don't want to give it an out. I want it to always tell you what its most likely category is. Um, what will happen usually is the top three categories will all be about the same likelihood. Unless there is something on your face that is very characteristic of a Medtronic advisor, which is possible. So there are some, some pacemakers in this that have a really big, fat, round capacitor on it in the middle, right? And it's very characteristic. So one of my students last year found if he got a cat with a, a brig, uh, someone shiny like it, had a really white eye in the centre, he put it in, it said it was a, a St. Jude whatever it was, because it had a big white circle on the inside, and none of the other pacemakers have that. Um, so yeah, should we just quickly pick another one, so you don't think I'm corrupt? Um, sorry? Put a cat in, all right. Uh, it, well, we'll see. It depends, if, if there's something about the cat's face that is very typical of one of the classes, should we pick this? Um, then it, w it may actually be quite confident in its prediction. But why don't we see? Um, oh, why don't we save that? Um, oh my god, I'm using Bing. Right. Uh, excellent. OK. Oh, this is, oh dear, this is a transparent picture. Let's not use that. That might be asking for trouble. Let's use this guy. Okay. Also, this picture isn't square either, so it's really not going to like this, probably. Um, it does crop them. Um, so, it might be okay. So, yeah, morgue, that's good, isn't it? Maybe. So it's having a long think about this one. Um, there we go. So it thinks it's re interesting. It thinks it's a reveal device. 
Um, so these are very rare types of devices. Um, that obviously are, they are the only devices that don't look like pacemakers. So that... Yeah, yeah, this is true, yeah, what happens to do? Um, that's a good idea. So this is interesting, because this is the only device that doesn't look like a pacemaker in the data set. So I suspect the reason it picks this as a Medtronic link is because it's lacking all the other features that tell it it's a pacemaker. So it doesn't have a big battery. It doesn't have a load of capacitors on it. So that's actually, as stupid answers go, that's actually quite reassuring. Good, okay. Excellent, so let's just go back to our thing. Excellent, so uh, we're not the only people that have done this, so this got into nature a couple of years ago. This was people who've done supervised learning with uh, malignant skin lesions. So they've got melanomas, but they've also got benign skin lesions, and they just took picture after picture after picture after picture, and they got a load of dermatologists to say what they thought it was, and in some of them they'd had biopsies for proof, and they did supervised learning, and it was very good. And it was actually better than an individual dermatologist. Okay? And that got into nature. I will not get into nature, unfortunately. Good. So, in conclusion, uh, computers are very good at maths, but they're not very good at problem solving. They're not good at lateral thinking like humans, and it's very difficult to program computers to do that. But machine learning is changing things. It's everywhere. Um, it can be hard to train a computer, A, to get the data, but also B, it can be quite difficult to even think about how you're going to go around tackling the problem. However, once you do train it, they're very fast, and they can train on huge amounts of data. Most machine learning stuff you will see in papers is supervised, so we give it an answer, and we want it to kind of come up with that answer itself. Uh, and neural networks are one type of machine learning and they are very useful in image recognition, so the pacemaker's example. Good. Any questions? Go ahead. There's a lot of optimistic outlook that <laughs> learning could replace a radiologist cardiac imaging. We think one of us wants to go into cardiac imaging cardiologist. That would be a bad trip. So there's a very famous quote which is something along the lines of um, AI won't replace radiologists, but radiologists that do do AI will replace those that don't. Okay? Um, I think in the next 10 years or so, humans will be supervising everything the AI does. Okay? Uh, because it's unpalatable. The slight problem radiology has, I think, is humans would not care, patients would not care, the radiologist got replaced. Patients don't know what a radiologist is, they never meet him, right? So why would they care if someone in the back room was replaced by a computer? Cardiologists, respiratory physicians, GPs, people like that, they're much safer because humans still want to see a human, right? They, wouldn't, they would actually be upset if they were not seeing a human or they felt the computer was making decisions without it being checked on. But I don't think anyone, unfortunately, would care for a radiologist to respond. I don't think it will happen in the next 10 years, but it probably will happen to some extent afterwards. But you'll still need people to make decisions based on that. So I think imaging with something will always be a job. But I'd be slightly wary about doing pure imaging, I think. A lot of people disagree with me, but um, to see how far things have come on, on in the last five years, it seems a bit silly to be making predictions of no in the next 10. Uh, so uh, this thing, so basically I don't just feed it Medtronics, I feed it all the different types of Medtronics and all the different types of Boston, so all different types of Sengi. So I think we've got about 50 different categories. So it's accuracy, about 95% getting the class, the exact class rate. In fact, I guess, so it, it doesn't matter specifically. Hmm. Uh, it is for this because the problem is about getting the manufacturer right. Because when you want to bring the right programmer to the patient's bedside to turn off the shocks, if you thought it was a Medtronic advisor but it was a Medtronic adapter, it doesn't matter because all the Medtronic stuff uses the same programmer. 
So for this, so for manufacturer accuracy, my thing is 99.6% accurate. So that's certainly enough. Now we're talking about rolling out for other applications. So for example, take a picture of a pacemaker and say whether or not it's safe to go in an MRI scanner. Now for that, manufacturer isn't what you care about. You need the exact model. And 95% accuracy is not good enough for that. But that's a very good question. Um, good. Any other questions? Of course, yeah. See that you put in as a data set, okay? Yeah. And then the middle part is the part that if it's right red, then it's highly accurate, positive, given it. Um, so how, how does that, how, how does that? Yeah, so actually let me go back to, so this was just, actually, this is, to go back to your last thing, if the thing was perfect, there would not be any colour outside of this diagonal line, because this blob being dark means 100%, so it means 100% of bi Biotronic Actros devices were labelled as Biotronic Actros devices. So you can see a couple of them, this one for example, about, it gets about 40% of them wrong. It thinks 40% of Boston contact renewals are actually Boston vitalities. But like I said, because it's got the manufacturer right, that 40% error rate in that class doesn't actually matter. Um, so let me show you the example again. So if I write bonjour, right. So your question is, so just, yeah. So how do you come Okay, so from these levels onwards, the activity of this cell can only be between zero and one. Okay, so if everything feeding into this, every synapse feeding into this is not firing, or in fact is firing by a negative value, this will be bounded at zero. Okay? This one is probably one or close to one, okay? These synapses going onwards, say for example there's a synapse here between this one and this one, that synapse will have a certain value associated with it. Okay, let's say 0.5. If this is one and this is 0.5, this will pass 0.5 across. If this was 0.5 and this was 0.5, it would pass a quarter along and everything feeds into these neurons and they all add up and it comes out with an overall activity, okay? The numbers don't seem to make sense, but actually that's kind of how your brain works. Neurons can either fire, well, neurons in your brain, they're either firing very rapidly, which we call a one in this, or they're firing not at all, which we call a zero. And if the neurons are stimulatory, they can be both very stimulatory, which is having a number here, say closer to one, or they can be barely stimulatory at all, a number closer to 0 0.1, so that's very little of that signal through, or it can even be negative and be an inhibitory neuron like you have in your brain. And it's quite weird to kind of conceptualize what that means, but in neural networks where, particularly for images, where you have lots and lots and lots of layers, it's a bit like those experiments with Hubel and Weasel. Do you remember these from neurology? So where they got a cat, or a rat, I can't remember which, and they cut the back of its head off, and they, put, uh, they found one nerve in V1, the first layer of the optic cortex, okay? and they're trying to figure out what made that neuron fire. Okay? And they found out that if they got a piece of A4 with a vertical black line on it, and went like this, nothing happened. But if they went like this, the neuron started firing. Okay? So that neuron they'd obviously plugged into was a horizontal line detector, okay? And if you do neural networks with images, you realize that's what happens. So this layer, if this was images, would be a horizontal line detector, a vertical line detector, right? If you tick, stick two, if you turn off, imagine this was your horizontal line detector, this was your vertical line detector, right? And you do a very strong neuron, there's very strong synapse between here and here, and a very strong synapse between here and here, if this is firing a lot, what would that mean? It means that they're both there. Uh, yeah. 
So now you've got a cross detector, right? And then if you had, a, I don't know, um, a circle detector somewhere else in the neural network, and you had silences from both of those leading together, you would have a neuron then that activates when you show it across in a circle, okay? So the more layers you have in the neural network, the more intelligent it can be in finding more and more features. So that's why in the image processing neural network, we have many, 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 many layers. And the early layers are very fundamental things like, is there, are there many vertical lines in this? Is it bright? Is it dark? Is it more red? Is it more blue? But later on, you have much more complex decisions. So halfway through the network, you might have a face detector, which is based around, is there a line here? Is there a line here? Is there a line here? Okay. But then later than that, it might be, is it a person with their eyes open or eyes closed? Okay. Um, but it's quite difficult to conceptualize, um, but it's probably working just like our brain. So in the Hubel and Weasel experiments, they realized that when they shoved the needle further into the cat's brain, they had to show it more and more specific features to get the nerves to fire. So, I have told a fib with this neural network. You've asked a very good question. So it is not possible when I tell you all a neuron can do is fire or not fire, it's impossible to stick a B in it, right? Um, there's, what is a B, right? Actually, each one of these is actually 26. So this isn't 15 long, it's 15 times 26 wrong. So if I, fire, if I stick an A in the first one, the very first neuron is firing for an A, and the remaining 25 aren't. If I stick a B in the first neuron, the first one isn't firing, the second one is, and the other ones aren't. So you're right. This doesn't actually make sense, what I've done here. I actually have 25 times, 26 times 15 neurons in the input layer, because in each position, you have to encode for every letter in every position. So it's actually 15 times 26 neurons, which is whatever it is, uh, 390. Yeah, 390. But good question. Okay, so, sorry. Um, that means, so for all these letters, obviously, matching corresponding position. Yeah, exactly. So, you would, would be generating all the values in one for each. No, so these, this is crap. This is bullshit. I've just drawn this because it looks nice. This is real, okay, but you have to imagine there are actually 390 neurons here, okay? So there's 390 neurons here, and 390 times, if this is 20, 390 times by 20 synapses here, not 15 times by 20. But other than that, it is identical. And it may as well, from, from understanding how it works, it makes absolutely no difference. Um, the reason I did it that way is you could say, all right, when there's an A in the first one, we'll set the value to 126. And when there's a B, we'll set it into 226. And when we're setting C, and so on, and Z is 1.0, and A is, A could even be naught, but 0.0, whatever, whatever, 26. You could do it that way. The problem is that's much harder for the neural network. And also, it's a bit illogical, because that's like saying B is really like C, it's really close, and Z is really like X, but they're not. They're just as different from B is as like Z as C is, right? So they shouldn't actually be close to each other in our data set. Um, so that's why actually I haven't done it that way. I've split it out into 390 neurons, but I can't draw 390 neurons on the screen, so I've just pretended I've made it. But it works identically to how I said, ignoring that law. But good question. Anything else? Yeah. Just a lot of data. Oh, you've been Googling me. Um, so it's funny you should say that. Uh, no, that's why it's horrendously out of date. Um, a student has got in touch with me to ask whether he can update it. Um, if you are interested in updating it, fire me an email. Um, and you can either help him, or if he ends up not doing anything, you can help me. Um, you don't have to have any programming knowledge. You just have to be able to sit there and um, fill in the fields on the website for me. But yeah, I've got a website of evidence-based medicine and cardiology that used to be very good and is now a little bit old-fashioned. Go ahead. Um, taking your <coughs> work, um, are there more applications are there more applications 
Oh, that's so hard. So the only reason why I'm not doing more things is because it's actually quite difficult to think of the ideas that are solvable, because you need sufficient amount of data that is labelled and is high quality. So, and is small. So pacemakers is perfect because the images are quite small. You know exactly what's in them, and if I put a Medtronic advisor in you or a dog under an X-ray machine, they look identical. Right? The stuff in the background doesn't matter. Okay, you, you might have bigger ribs than the dog, but, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and if you take it and turn it upside down and flip it around and things like that, it'll still be recognizable. Most things don't work quite that well. There are other things I'm doing, so classification of echocardiograms, um, trying to figure out, so the project we did with last year's BSC students was we got ECGs from people who have wolf pockets and white ablations, so they had delta waves on their ECGs, and we tried to learn exactly where in the heart the pathway was from the shape of the ECG. Again, that's quite good, because they're having an ablation, you know exactly where it was when they did the ablation, so you have your labels, and you have a high quality ECG, because everyone who has it gets an ECG, and it's also not very complex data because it's just 12 leads, so it's 12 different waveforms, all of which are just a horizontal line with a neck in it. So it's very small amounts of data which can be labelled very accurately, but most things don't work that well. If you have the ideas, it's very easy to do, but having the ideas is the difficult. But yes, it's going to be used a lot going forward. Anything else? Like what? So obviously, you know, I'm re able to recognise. Surely, learning how it's using that. Does it have? So you're saying that if you fed it a picture of a pacemaker, could it say? Not only do I think this is a bust and whatever it is, but this is the one like it I've seen the most, and it brings yeah. up that. No. No, fortunately not, because the number of neurons it has in it is physically incapable of holding that much data. So even if it were possible, so for example, do you remember the example of the dictionary thing? The neural network was 72 kilobytes. The dictionary, we said, was 4 meg. Okay, so the dictionary is almost 100 times larger. So by definition, it could not store the words it's looking at. That's an advantage, actually, because it stops it from cheating. One of the big problems with neural networks is they do learn to memorize. And when you feed it a load of examples, it gets really good at them, because it isn't actually saying, this is a Boston because it's got a cool capacitor on it. It says, this is a Boston because this is image number 267. And I remember that image 267 is Boston because it just learns to recognize that specific picture. Um, so if you had a neural network that was big enough, so for example, if you had a neural network that was as big as the one I trained the pacemakers on, and I showed it each example a million times, and there was no pattern to the words, so let's say I randomly swapped around the French and the German words and just split them into two lists, it would probably, if I showed it enough times, it would probably learn to be quite good at telling them apart. And that would be remembering them, right? Because there's no pattern. The only way you could do it is by remembering them. The problem is, getting it out of that is very difficult. Because it's not memorized and written down the words thing. It's encoded it just by tweaking synapses. And currently getting stuff like that out of it is very difficult. There, there are some ways to do it. So in our pacemaker paper, what we do is we look at images of, we get, we, for example, we take a Boston, we feed it into the neural network, and we look at which pixels in that image were most influential in deciding it was a Boston. So for example, if, if there's a bit in the top left that's really, 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 really important, that's probably a unique circuit board component to Bostons, for example. But that's about as good as you can get. You can't get the original pictures out. Good. Any other questions? Right. OK, well, I hope that was interesting. Um, this is something that you guys are going to see increasingly going forwards. Um, you don't have to be able to do it, although if you can code, obviously, it's amazing. But you don't have to be able to do it. But you probably will have to be able to understand it and certainly be um, suspicious of it. Um, because people will say something is AI or machine learning or things like that, and um, it'll look great, but it won't work in practice. The main way they get you, the main way they get you 
is getting the neural network to remember things without learning things. So the important thing is having two data sets. I should put this in the talk, really. Having two data sets, if you have the pacemakers, you train it on three quarters of the pacemakers, and you keep a quarter back at the end that it has never seen before. And the accuracy is how well it does on those. Because in all of these things, on the training set, it gets about 99% accurate because it cheats. It remembers certain ones, but you, what you do is you show it ones it's never seen before, and that is the accuracy. And the first time you read a paper on machine learning, you should make sure they have a separate train and test set. And if they don't, you should throw it in the bin because uh, it won't work in the real world, unfortunately.